flashlights are like any other tool. They're purpose built for a specific application. So for example, this would be one of my best EDC flutters. And right over here, we have a convoy thrower. And this thing is amazing for throw. But let's say you want one flashlight to do a bunch of things, a jack of all trades, if you will. Well, the Sparris TH11K is the new king of multi-purpose. Welcome back to Shoe Lights. Today I've got the Sparris TH11K and I was really excited to be able to review this light because it is just a new design which I've never seen before that allows you to have throw, flood, a handheld light, a weapon light, and multiple colors all in one light with charging built in. Very exciting. Now, what makes it so special, and I'm not going to wait, I'm not going to you know, dole this out and tell you 10 minutes into the video, is that it has user-changeable light engines. Literally, you could just unscrew it and put a new light engine in right in the design. It's designed for user swaps in the field. So let's take a look at it and how this works. First off, it comes in this really great box. The best statistic I've seen on the entire cover here is this. It comes with a five-year warranty. Now let's take a look inside and see what it comes with. So I've got the light outside already. The light was just sitting in here like so. But you'll notice that it has a manual, well, more of a pamphlet with micro writing, but it's got, it's got enough. The manual is, is easy enough to follow. It's got the light. It's got two additional engines because an engine's in there already. It's got a lanyard and some O-rings. And then right here, it's got a tape switch for weapon mounting. Now, I'm not a weapon guy, so I'm going to leave most of the specifics of that to people that know more than I do, but I will show you basic operation of it in a moment and then it's also got this uh you know this weapon holder i suppose and it looks pretty basic this looks like it would fit on a variety of things it's basically just a clamp it looks like it's made out of delrin or some other kind of uh dense really dense but non-scratchable plastic uh so it, it's pretty simple but i mean it gets the job done and uh let's dive right in all right, let's take a look at the front. So it's got a large, a spheric lens instead of a reflector. So this is basically what we call affectionately a zoomy. Now, one of the things that makes it so good is that the LED that they're using, the white LED, and let's see if we can get a shot of that. That emitter in the bottom there has a perfectly round phosphor surface. So that gives this zoomy an advantage that other zoomies often don't have. And that is that when you zoom in tightly, you focus on the phosphor surface and instead of the beam being square, it's actually round. So this is a round beamed flood and thrower throughout the whole range. So let's go ahead and take a look at its basic operation. There is a tail button on the back here and you just click it and it comes on and it's not very clicky. In fact, it feels like an E-switch. I'm not really sure about that, but I don't feel any... There's, no, there's not really any, like, inward click and then latch. So uh, I think it's an E-switch, and that kind of bears out when you take a look at the tape switch later, that it's probably electronically driven. But now, take a look. You can see that I've got it kind of in flood mode right now. And as I turn this, you can see that it gets narrower. Now, I'm way too close to show this effectively. So let me bring, this is really, I mean, I'm still only just off camera here. See, you see the lens? Just off camera. But you can see that it is quite a flood, and then it becomes quite a point. It'll be really small when we're using it at reasonable ranges. Now, one of the other cool things about the switch is it's actually a variable dimmer. Check this out. I can dim it down or come higher, and you can see it's completely analog. So that is a really cool feature. So there you go, you can see that now I'm on flood mode on its maximum amount, and you can see that gets quite bright. Now I've got uh, auto exposure on right now, so the camera's not really gonna show it truly, but we'll go outside and see it later. Now, the fact that it's a zoomy that actually has a round spot is already a really cool thing. But that is not what caught my attention. What caught my attention was the design of it. And I'm going to show you how to change light engines now. Okay, so you zoom out a little bit. 
Um, you know, this, this is an extra step that I like to do, and I'll show you in a moment, but I like to take the battery out first. You do not have to do that. Do, you do not. But I'll tell you why. It's because it relieves pressure on the spring. You'll, you'll see in a second. So take the battery out. Then take the head off by holding right here and unscrewing. So it's, it's undoing right there. And once you get that off, all right, here we go. Then take this and retract it. Okay, there you go. You expose that kind of brass knurled spot right there. And that's where you're going to put in one of your other light engines. And it comes with two additional light engines. So the one that's in there right now is a round white. And I'm going to take that out there like this. Okay, be careful not to touch the emitter phosphor surface when you do this. Keep your fingies right there on the brass knurl. And then once this pops out... And by the way, since this is all lubed up, because I, when I, I mean around here, it's all lubed up for the uh, zoomability, I, you, know, you should probably keep your fingers right on the brass only. Now, I'm going to take these two, and if you look at them, you can see that one looks kind of dark. That's going to be your red light. And this one that looks kind of yellowy, that's actually your green, okay? So if you want to ID them, the largest, like, I don't know, light yellow is, is the cool white. The darker yellow and it's square, these two are square, is going to be green and this one's going to be red. So let's take a look at the green right now. So I'll pop it out here like this. And you can see that these are just self-contained little light engines with springs on them. So cool. What a neat idea. So then I'm just going to screw this in here. And, and by the way, the fact that there's a spring on here, that's why I took the battery out and took the cap off because it just relieves pressure, kind of makes it easier to get this thing out. And if you're going to be changing this a lot, you really do not have to screw this down super tight. I mean, I'd give it just a, a two finger light snug, but don't go hog wild on it because it, it, there's no need. This whole thing is conductive. Okay. You're just going to make it harder to get out later. So now that I got zoomed in, uh, screwed in, I'm going to go ahead and zoom out like this, get the uh, threads up a little bit. Then I'm going to put the head back on. Okay. All right. There you go. The threads are fine on the head. They're not, they've never been hard for me to get started, but since they're fine, just be careful you don't cross thread them. And then uh, pop the battery back in and put the tail back on. And since there's a spring in here and a spring in here, which is good because that means you can use unprotected cells, protected cells. There's a lot of extra travel, a lot of extra compression. You can use all, a variety of different 18650s in here. But I want to point out that because of that, um, you do have to kind of push hard against the cell, push like that to get the thread started. Okay. Oh, and, and while we're at it, let's just take a look at the battery. You can see that it is a, let's see here, where's the specs? It is an 18650, uh, 3100 milliamp hours, uh, and it's rechargeable, but there's no recharge port in the battery. But you know what? There is a charge port on the light itself. So this is a complete kit. You don't need exterior, external charger. Okay, so now that I gotta put all back together, let me push this stuff aside. Let me put this light engine in there. And you can see that when I click it on, it is in fact now green. Wee! Oops, I hit the wrong button. Okay, let's try it again. And there you go, green. It's zoomable and it is dimmable. So let me go ahead and dim that out. Awesome. All right. Very, very cool thing. You know what? I'll While I'm talking, I'll talk about other things, but I'll show you. And I'm going to do it with the battery on this time just to show it it's possible. But while I'm doing this, I'll show you the red because I just feel like people would want to see it. So... Uh, oh, and by the way, if you back this up too much, it'll actually come off and then slide down. No big deal. Just kind of get up here, get started again, and get it back on those threads. Okay, so get that off there. Now, while we're hanging here watching me switch to the final engine, let me point out a couple other things about this light. It is very lightweight. Uh, the machining is great. The anodization is great. Uh, it has kind of a satin feel to it. Not high gloss, but not like matte. It's definitely kind of a satin feel. Uh, oh, by the way, you can now see that that battery is hanging in there. You can see that I'm going to have to kind of push against it with the uh, spring just a little. Not a big deal, but it worked. Do you see a little, little bit there? Here, check it out. I'll try it again. Watch this. When I first make contact, this is another reason I know it's an e-switch. Watch. When I first start doing it, watch. Oh, I didn't do it that time. There it is. Boop. Okay, so there's a little flash there. So I know that it is an E-switch. 
And uh, there was nothing in the manual about having to remove the battery, though. So you're safe to do it like this. And uh, it is easier to get this on if you make this come up a little bit like that, though. I did notice that. So go ahead and get that threaded. Get that back on there. And we will do... There we go. There's some red. So uh, I'll dim it a little bit. Come up a little slowly. And let's do some zooming, right? Okay, cool. Um, you can't really tell because I'm so close. I'm at hyperfocal right now. But if I was at the right distance, and maybe you can start to see it. I'm, I'm trying to really stretch here. But this uh, LED is going to become square on the two square LEDs at full focus. Uh, but that's great that they included a round, I think it's a yinding, I'm not sure, uh, I haven't ID'd this, but it's probably a Chinese-made yinding emitter, and this looks very similar to the emitter that Olight included in their uh, new Javalot Mini. The Javalot Mini has a perfectly round beam as well. Let's talk about the tape switch operation for weapons. So, typically with tape switches, they have a secondary cap, so you take the tail cap off, put a new cap on that has a tail to the switch itself. This one's a little different in that you keep the cap the way it is and you peel up the flappy doodle here and notice it does kind of turn out of the way and it's captive so you don't lose it. And the tape switch has a USB-C connector that has a 90 degree bend and you just insert it right there. Now on the tape switch here, it's got a large surface and at first I gotta tell you now, maybe this is silly cause I'm not a weapon guy and maybe I just don't know such things. But I thought this switch was broken at first because I was clicking it and it was working. But then I was clicking over here and it didn't seem to be working. And I was clicking over here and it didn't seem to be working. I was like, what? I was like, we're a janky switch. No, no, guys. It's one, two, three switches. It's a multi-function switch. So in the middle is on off. Okay. And it, on the left here towards the tail, you press and hold. And it decreases brightness. Yeah, there you go. So now it's really low. So on, off, decrease brightness, and this goes to 100% every time. So decrease over here, back up over here, off over here. Pretty cool. All right, let's test the lumens. So the box claims that it does 600 lumens. I'm assuming that's on white. Maybe it's on green. Well, we got the white in it right now I'll turn it down all the way start it at the lowest and I'll make sure it's full flood so that I get the best reading on my tube and it's 13 lumens to start with and then let's go ahead and turn it up up oh, I'm off my scale and now I'm about 435 lumens and guys I act like I hadn't done this yet before but I've done it several times 430 lumens is what I've been getting all day even when I make sure the battery is just hot off the charger so definitely not the 600 that they're claiming all right i've swapped out the engine i got the white over here green is now in there let's go ahead and start it on the lowest and it is six lumens let me double check let me make sure it's at the yes yeah, seven seven point one lumens see when i pop the range up it rounds down but let's go ahead and see what it is at its highest 240 lumens. There you go. That's kind of what I figured just based on what my eye was seeing. Typically on throwers, green emitters are brighter. So for example, if you've taken Osram W1 and it's white, Osram W1 green, the green is going to be about 20% brighter, but that's not what's going on here. And oh, by the way, there's the emitter just bare. There you go. A little fun little thing there. If you want a mule without any protection, that is no glass or anything over it, but you just want pure flood. I guess you got it. All right. So let's turn it all the way down. Let me reset this. And so six lumens on the right. Oh, wow. That's actually higher than I thought. And let's go all the way to the top. 150 lumens. That's a little more than I thought. I thought it was going to be around 100. So I knew it was going to be the dimmest of the three. But there you go. So 430 lumens for the white, uh, less for the green, and then the least for the red. Okay, we're outside to take a look at the Spiris TH11K. And we're going to check it out initially with the white engine against the Javalot Mini. Because they're pretty similar lights in that they have these circular dies here. So let's go ahead and take a look 
first at and take a look at the beam on the ground. So I'll start at kind of a low intensity here. So we're at low intensity and I'm all the way out on the zoom and I'll go ahead and go brighter and I've got the exposure locked. So that's as bright as it goes and then I'm dimming it down to as low as it goes. Okay, now let's go ahead and focus it and you can see how when it focuses it becomes very intense hot spot. There's still a little bit of spill but it's it's not a lot of spill though. I mean the spill is so decreased. I mean it's exacerbated by my camera but to my eye it's pretty much all hot spot. It's almost LEP looking. By contrast, the Javelot only has a fixed beam, so you've got low here, and you got the hot spot, a little bit of corona right here, and then the spill out to about there, and then that's on high. So you got two modes. Now let's take a look at it on distant objects here. Now this tree right here is 20 meters. Not this first tree, but the second tree is 55 meters. And way in the back, the four all the way at the back, those are 150 meters. So let's do both lights here. I'm going to start out with the Sparrow TH11, and I'm going to be full flood on this tree here. So that's full flood, and then I'm going to go ahead and focus it. And notice that when I focus about that far, it's pretty round. But when I focus all the way, oh, lost focus on my camera, notice how it is still a circle. And it's a circle because that's the shape of the die. You'll see when I go to the red beam and the green beam, they'll be squares. Now, interestingly, this light is not as bright as the Javalot. Let me do the Javalot here. But the thing is, is the Javalot has a wider hotspot. So intensity-wise, it's actually more intense. You can see that. You can see that this is more intense than this is. So that means that at the end of the street there at 150 meters, this is actually brighter than the Javalot is. The Javalot covers more trees, all four, but this one is definitely more intense. So that means that this light will go further if you need it. Now, because the Javalot is brighter, if I, let me lock my focus here, if I were to adjust this to kind of encompass all four trees, let me do something like that, you will see that even though I'm all the way up, you'll see that that is not as bright as the Javalot. So this fixed beam Javalot is definitely brighter, but it just does less different kinds of scenarios than the TH11K does. Again, this is why I say this is a jack of all trades, master of none, but if you want a jack of all trades, this'll do it. Okay, right here in the street off camera, I have switched the engines and now I have put the green in and it took me about, I don't know, 30 seconds or so. Now I'm gonna switch and show you the TH11 against an ace beam L19 green. So these are completely different lights. This has a very large TIR optic, whereas this is the aspheric lens. And this is a W2 green. I think it's a W2 green. It's hard to know because ace beam doesn't publish the specs, but is definitely the brightest green that I have. So let's start out with the TH11 and I will shine it on the ground here and I'll go ahead and adjust it so that you can see beam shape. So that's as wide as it goes. Give you an idea of what it would cover. And now let me go ahead and make it tight and I'll put it on this tree here. And I'll put it on this tree here and you can see that it has definitely got a square pattern to it. Whereas, you know, the ace beam here will not have a square pattern, it has a circular pattern. But still notice that the TH11, the Sparse TH11, is more intense than even the ace beam is just based on the fact that it's a tighter hotspot. And down at the end of the street, you can see the same thing. I got two trees here over with the ace beam. Oop, got to get focus again. Two trees with the ace beam. Here is only part of one tree, but you can see it is brighter. So again, more candela, which means more throw with the Sparrows. So remember, that was 150 meters back there. Let's look mid-distance at 55 meters here on this tree. 
So there is the ace beam at turbo, and here is the Sparris at full intensity and full focus. Okay, off camera, I switched it once again, it took me about 30 seconds, and it was very easy to do, and, and now I've got the red engine in it. So let's take a look on the ground here. I've got it full focused, let me go ahead and zoom it out. So we got, let's go lower intensity, higher intensity, so that's the highest it goes. We'll go ahead and zoom it in on this tree here, and you're gonna see again that it is a square pattern. When you focus it with that aspheric lens, here we go on that tree 55 meters away, and back at the 150 meters for palm trees at the back. So again, this is a phenomenal light if you want a light that does everything. You want a light that does flood, throw, multiple colors, weapon light, this is the one. All right, I threw the white engine back in the light for a moment. I'm gonna turn it all the way down, go full flood, and show you the lowest and most spread out it can be. Now I'm gonna go ahead and turn the intensity up and show you what full flood looks like in the street here. And then I'll go ahead and tighten it up and show you how it can look at kind of a medium focus. And then here, fully focused. You know, a lot of people call zoomies like this a poor man's LEP, and you can see why. It's just, it's just a laser beam, isn't it? Like there's practically, there is spill, but practically no spill. It's just like a laser beam. This Sparris TH-11K is one well thought out light. And if you're looking for a jack of all trades, dot, 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 master of none, then this is the one to go for. This really does flood and throw, does multiple colors, handheld, weapon, it does it all. So if you're looking for one light to rule them all, look no further than the Sparris TH-11K. All right, guys, thanks for watching my video. I'm going to see you in the next one.